Okay, so guys, the topic for today, and this is the big idea for the rest of chapter 19 and the next two days is Gibbs Free Energy. The way today is going to roll is we are going to quantify entropy. Uh, we're going to talk about how we measure disorder. Um, remember, it's disorder and not order. So uh, when we're done with that, we, well, we'll introduce the idea, we'll solve a problem. Then we'll introduce the concept of Gibbs free energy. But we're not going to get into the practical application of Gibbs free energy until Tuesday, and that'll wrap up the unit. So you guys good to go? Uh, other way around, sort of, because there, there's kind of math of Gibbs free energy, but it's really not the, the important part. So today is going to be more mathematical. Tuesday will be more conceptual. Yeah, you'll see. Okay, so guys, let's talk about how we quantify entropy. So there's the possibility that what I'm about to share with you may seem weird or possibly unnecessary. So let's give you the background on this. Holy smokes. Okay, look, it's our good friend, the brass block. Remember that guy? Okay, and so guys, remember when we were playing with our good friend Brass Block, we hadn't even got into chapter 19. We weren't talking about entropy. We were simply talking about enthalpy. And back then, we even still had work, so we weren't even talking about enthalpy. We were talking about internal energy, which is this, you get the idea. Okay, uh, okay. So, and guys, we said something really interesting about internal energy. We said that we can't measure it. Do you remember that? We talked about the idea that you can't shove an energyometer into this thing and figure out how much energy that it has. So instead of empirically measuring amounts of energy, what did we say we do? What do we actually measure instead? Changes in energy, right? And then we got rid of work and then heat became the only way to change the energy of the block. And at that point, we realized that because we're really talking about changing heat, what is it that we're actually measuring as we track changes in energy? We're measuring changes in temperature. Remember that whole, that, okay. Well guys, it turns out that entropy is exactly the opposite. It turns out that unlike enthalpy changes that we, I'm sorry, un, yeah, unlike enthalpy changes, that we really can't, we can't measure energy, so we measure energy change. Guys, entropy is the opposite. There's no real direct way to measure changes in entropy. So instead, what we do is we actually measure the entropy of systems. So it's conflicting with what we talked about with enthalpy. With enthalpy said, we can't measure the enthalpy of something, but we can measure heat changes, and that allows us to calculate changes in enthalpy. Guys, this is different. With entropy, we can't measure changes in entropy. So what we do is we figure out how much entropy a system has before, then we measure how much entropy a system has after, and by comparing, we can figure this out. So in order to do that, what we do is experimentally, we gather data, and this allows us to measure the entropy of a system. And guys, these are, these are absolute values. These are empirically collected pieces of data. So we can take this brass block and figure out how much entropy it has. Mm, no, there's, and we're, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. How do we, yeah. Joules. Yeah, you can actually, joules per mole. You can actually measure how screwed up something is and quantify it in joules per mole. Guys, that's about to come up on the board. But understand it's not kilojoules per mole. It's joules per mole. Because when we do enthalpy, we talk about kilojoules per mole because they tend to be big energies. When we talk about entropies, we're talking about joules per mole because screwed up tends to be on a smaller scale. Okay, so, oh, go ahead. 
And that's a part of it. And so let's talk about that. So guys, how did, and you're never gonna have to do this in this class, but let's talk about it because I know that you're curious. So guys, understand, and let's review, you can't measure the energy of this block, right? But you can measure the entropy of this block. But understand, we don't have an entropyometer that we can stick into the side of this to measure entropy. So what are the things we would need to measure or know about the block in order to figure out how screwed up it is? So what do we measure? And that's the way they do this when they're actually doing this, is they measure bunches of different things, plug that data into equations that then spits out the entropy of the system. So guys, what is entropy dependent upon? What were the what are the things that you would need to know about this in order to figure out its entropy? First of all, temperature. We would need to know how hot it is. So guys, what would the relationship be between temperature and entropy? As temperature goes up, what happens to entropy? It also goes up. So one of the things we would need is temperature. Jake, go with your idea too degrees of freedom, right? But guys, to quantify degree of freedom, and do you, are you hearkening? Heart, I just said hearkening. Are, are you going back to what we talked about with the two vessels where we had two and two or one and one or one and one, and we were talking about all the possible combinations? Guys, we can do that sort of, but more practically, when we determine degrees of freedom, Think about it this way. What about a substance determines how many degrees of freedom it's got? Its density, its state, and the volume of the container that it contains. And so guys, those are other things that we talk about. So let's talk about it. What would density, what's the relationship between density and entropy? If something is more dense, would it have higher or lower entropy? Lower. The tighter packed it is, the less messed up it can be. Guys, what about the volume of its container? The bigger the container, what happens to entropy? Up, right? The bigger the container, the more possible permutations. Guys, this is the critical one, state. Solid liquid gas, what's that got to do with entropy? Now, but realize you can heat and cool a solid and it's still a solid. We're talking phases. Which phase would have the highest entropy? Gases. And guys, we're going to bring that up on the board in just a second. But understand that phase is a huge determinant of entropy. Solids have the lowest entropy. Gases have the highest entropy and so on. So guys, great list. But again, you don't need to know any of that. It's just interesting to think about. So when we come up with entropies of substances, those are the things they measure. They plug this data into equations. If you're curious, you can look up the equations and then we can actually calculate the entropy for a system. You get the idea? Okay, so guys, we call these things standard molar entropies. We abbreviate it S naught. So what are the units for screwed up? And guys, the units for screwed up are joules per mole Kelvin. So you can measure how disordered something is in joules. Guys, entropy is an energy and it actually carries the same units joules, but notice what else it depends upon moles in Kelvin. Now guys, we already talked about temperature, right? The hotter something is, the more screwed up it is. But what else do you learn from the fact that moles is another unit? The more of something you have, the more screwed up it is, right? If you've got one brass block, you can actually figure out how screwed up this brass block is. Now if you've got two brass blocks, guess what? This is now twice as screwed up because you've got two screwed up things. So guys, the idea here is that entropy actually does depend upon the amount of matter. The more matter, the more screwed up it is. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So guys, with that said, then let's talk about the things that, that determine the entropy of a substance. And these are the guidelines. 
So guys, first of all this, do you remember when we talked about heats of formation? What were the heats of formation for all of the elements? Do you remember? Zero. Guys, the heats of formation for elements are zero. The idea is that they form without any exchange of energy. So remember when, let's put this in context. Guys, remember when we went uh, delta H reaction is equal to delta H products minus delta H reactants. Remember that stuff? What were the numbers that we plugged in there? Well, those were the heats of formation for the compounds that are involved in the reaction. What were the heats of formation for the elements? Zero. Do you remember that? You got to go back over this for the test. Well, guys, it turns out that while elements don't have heats of formation, they do have entropies. Doesn't that make sense? Ent elements are screwed up just like everything else. So, right. so guys, what we learned from that is that the entropies for elements are not zero. And notice these are not entropies of formation. These are entropies. We're not talking about how much the entropy of something changes as they're formed. We're talking about how screwed up is that element sitting there in its elemental form. Get the idea? Okay, guideline number two is this. And you said this. The entropy of gases is greater than liquids is greater than solids. Now, guys, these last two we haven't talked about yet. What are other things that determine how screwed up a sample is? And guys, the next thing you need to know is mass. The bigger something is, the more screwed up it is. Uh... I mean, yeah, no, not that you need to worry about. So guys, let me show you what we're talking about. Say that you have one mole of methane, and then we'll just use something off the test because it'll be familiar. Say you've got one mole of methane and you've got one mole of butane. Which one's going to have the higher entropy? Well, let's think through this. First of all, they're both gases, right? So we know that they're, they're, from the test, you remember butane, okay. So guys, they're both gases. If one of them was not a gas, the one that was a gas would be the most screwed up. But they're both gases, so we know that, that it's not a phase issue. But it turns out that the butane will have a higher entropy because these physically weigh more. They're more complicated. And so, guys, that's what that third bullet point is telling you, is that the, the, the more massive something is, the more screwed up it'll be. Yeah. Good. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Then it would, it would be the gas. That's a great question. So if you add, what is that, C8H18, which is the major component of gasoline. Um, so you're right that this is a liquid, and as a result, that would have a lower entropy, not because of its mass, but because of its, its phase. And so, guys, and this is the big idea. You're gonna find this as we get deeper into this. Phase trumps everything. And you're gonna see this on, you may even wanna jot, you, well, you may wanna just like underline this like 38 times. Guys, phase trumps everything. When you're trying to figure out how messed up something is, phase is always the major determinant. Yeah. So is there a, there is a hierarchy, I guess, of entropy Yeah, but the... the Yeah, so phase is the largest determinant. And then after that, they don't expect you to sort through the rest. Okay, so just remember phases and everything else is just... Exactly. But realize with that said, you guys are probably still going to miss it on the test. Okay. You guys good there? Okay, so the last determinant is this, guys. Entropy tends to increase 
with the number of atoms in a formula unit, which is really just a retelling of the third one. And then we have one more. So you could consider this one to be mass. You could consider this one to be complexity. And then, guys, this last, let me throw in the last one and then we'll talk. Guys, the last one's kind of interesting. Entropy also increases with elongation. We're going to talk about this a bunch when we get into intermolecular forces. It turns out that the longer the molecule is, the higher entropy it has, and that causes it to have stronger intermolecular forces. So guys, let me, let me show you what we're talking about here with this idea of elongation. Oh. We already graded that homework though, right? Okay, let, let me show you a different example. So guys, you probably don't know this, um, but I'll just give it to you. So. This is actually an alcohol. Um, I guess I can draw them all in. So this is an alcohol called propanol. You're probably not familiar with it, but you probably are familiar with its, um, its cousin. Let me draw it the same way or as close as I can. You're probably familiar with its cousin, which looks like this. Sorry. Oh, it did it again. Um, its cousin, which looks like this, like so. So let me, so here's the divider between the two. So guys, this is propanol. Uh, the bottom one is what's called isopropyl alcohol. So the probe tells you that there's three carbons. When it's a long chain, we call it propanol. When it forms sort of this tea-like structure, we call it isopropyl alcohol, which you guys may know as rubbing alcohol, stuff you buy at the grocery store. Which one's got a higher entropy? Well, let's talk. So they both have the same, they're in the same phase, right? They're, well, the top one's a liquid too. So they're in the same phase. They actually have exactly the same mass. Their chemical formulas are the same. They're what's called um, uh, isomers. Um, and then they also therefore have the same number of atoms. So which one's got the greater entropy? Why the top one? Because it's elongated. So guys, think about it this way. When molecules ball up, they tend to get less complex. So imagine yourself in a ball, and if you're all balled up, you're less complicated, you're more compact, you're less spread out, you're less messed up. Um, and molecules are the same way. The more compact they are, the, more, um, the lower their entropies are. So guys, let's do questions. Go ahead. Um, good question. And so think about it this way. So mass is an amount of matter, right? And the more matter that you have, the, you, you talked about this idea of, not, did you say permutations? So the more matter that you have, the more permutations, the more possible ways that matter could be organized at any given moment. And because it's got more possible permutations, it's more entropic. Oh, oh my gosh, it's, it's, ex yes, exactly, yeah, yeah, it's the whole system. <laughs> it depends on the class you're taking. <laughs> in this class, we just think of about it as mass, but if you're in your junior year taking quantum, taking quant, it goes all the way down to sub, 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 not atomic, but the things that make up protons, yeah, subnuclear, yeah, it goes, it goes all the way to the bottom. So, yeah, and it isn't a lot of fun, but yeah, yeah, but it is interesting. So you guys good on these ideas? 
Okay, so guys, now let's make this practical. So we understand conceptually that we can measure messed up in joules per mole Kelvin. We understand that there are some conceptual guidelines that help us understand how messed up something is. We understand that phase is the major predictor and then other things like mass, complexity, and elongation are secondary determinants. Um, but guys, what we've got to be able to do then is we've got to be able to calculate changes in entropy for processes. So grab your AP equation sheets and find this guy. I want a copy of this too. Does anybody need one? So my son is taking honors biology in ninth grade and he's like, dad, I need a periodic table. And I just had my note, my, my computer bag with me. And the only one I had was this one. <laughs> so I gave him this. He's like, dad, that's worthless. <laughs> I said, tell that to my AP students. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so guys look on the, the page four page, right? And um, you'll notice that this equation is the second equation, but it's the first of those three equations that all look the same, right? Now, the equation that you're familiar with is the one directly beneath this, which is the heats of formation. See what I'm saying? Now, guys, beneath that, you'll notice the next one down is change in G. And we're going to do this uh, in a minute, but change in G is change... Well, actually, we'll do it Tuesday. Change in G is change in Gibbs free energy. Now, the one that we're talking about now is entropy. But guys, comparing those three equations, what is the glaring exception as you compare the entropy equation to the enthalpy and the Gibbs free energy equations? The formations. Guys, notice that these are not entropies of formation. The other ones are. This is the heat of formation and the Gibbs free energy change of formation. And I know you don't even know what that means, but it is important that you understand that these are not entropies of formation. We are not talking about how much screwed up do things change when these things form. We're talking about once they're formed, how screwed up are they? Do you see the difference? Okay, so guys, with that, I think it would be appropriate to try to solve one of these. So I just made this up. And it says this. Calculate the delta S for the synthesis of ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen. And guys, we're going to do this together, and we're going to do this very carefully. And we're going to talk about it conceptually, and we're going to make some predictions before we even touch our calculators. I will take the bullet for the team, and I will go back to Appendix C, which you guys have all learned to hate. You know Appendix C, the one with all of the values. I will be the looker-upper guy. Okay, so guys, in order to do this, first thing we need is a balanced equation. Dig in. And ammonia is NH3. Write a balanced equation. And so guys, as you're writing the balanced equation, let me just let you know, um, when ammonia is formed through this process, you're going to find out in a couple weeks, this is called the Haber process. But when ammonia is formed in this process, it forms as a gas. So put subscripts on your reactants and products. Ammonia forms as a gas. So guys, why do we care about subscripts? Because we're talking about entropy. And what determines entropy more than anything else? Phase. So let me do this with you. 
uh, N2 gas H2 gas NH3 gas. Okay, so how does this balance? Two on the ammonia, three on the hydrogen? Is that right? How'd I do? Okay, so guys, go ahead. You shouldn't do the fractions of. No, yeah, not, not for this one. Yeah, because, and, and so Brandon, let's talk about why. The reason that we don't need to do the funky fraction thing is because it doesn't say calculate the change in entropy when one mole of NH3 is formed. I just don't like fractions. But realize that when we do the fractions, it's typically in those enthalpy calculations when it's saying, what is the heat of combustion of one mole of butane? and it's locking us into one mole of butane. At that point, then we have to balance it with fractions. See what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly, yeah, okay. So guys, do you understand what we're trying to figure out? When this process happens, what is the change in entropy? You good with the idea? Does screwed up go up or does screwed up go down? So before we come up with a number, because we're not just trying to figure out up or down, we're trying to get a number. But before we get into this, we're gonna talk about it conceptually first. Guys, drawing on the guidelines that you just wrote down, were there five of them? Guys, drawing on those guidelines, I would like you to please make a prediction. What is our number going to be? And I don't mean a value, I mean positive or negative. And let's talk about it. If the value's positive, screwed up went up. If the value's negative, screwed up went down. Entropy went down. So guys, I don't want a number, I want a sign. Is entropy going to be positive going up, indicating that screwed up's going up, or will entropy be negative down? screwed up goes down. So guys, I just think about it for a second, but be ready to justify your answer based upon the guidelines. So guys, let's talk about it. What is the major predictor of screwed up? Phase. Phase. Doesn't do us a bit of good, right? Everything's gases. They're all in screwed up -edness. So then let's start picking these off a little bit. Does elongation tell us much? Well, guys, these are all relatively compact molecules. Nitrogen is diatomic. H2 is diatomic. NH3 is trigonal pyramid. It's a pretty compact molecule. They're all relatively compact, so it's not going to be an elongation issue. Uh, will it be, a, will it be a, a mass issue? And guys, we know that it's not because this is the law of conservation of mass. The reactants and products weigh exactly the same. So where did your brain go? Will screwed up go up or down and why? But guys, rather than ask you to justify it, let me give you the answer. Entropy is going down. What? That's exactly it. Guys, here's the idea, and we can come at this from a lot of different directions. Remember, we have one brass block. If we have two brass blocks, screwed up went up, right? But now you're going, wait a minute, that's relative to mass. Well guys, it also holds true with moles. Here, and you could even think about it this way. How many moles of nitrogen do we have? One. How many moles of hydrogen do we have? Three. That's a total of four. So guys, we have four moles of gas over here. How many moles of gas do we have on the product side? Well, we've got two. So guys, we understand that we actually have physically more moles of particles on the left than we do on the right. So if we were thinking Avogadro's number, we would have four times Avogadro's number of particles over here 
we'd have two times Avogadro's particles over here. So literally, our products has got twice as many particles, I'm sorry, our reactants have twice as many particles as our products. And the more things that you have, the more possible permutations, and the greater the entropy will be. Does that make sense? So guys, the thought is that entropy will go down during this process because we have more moles of reactant than we have moles of product. Do you understand not just the idea, but the concept behind it? More things, more possible messed up. Okay, so guys, if entropy is going down, when we do this calculation and come up with delta S, what will the value be? Negative. So guys, when we do this math, we had better find out that delta S is negative or we did it wrong. So you guys ready to go? Let's do the math. So it goes like this. So delta S for the reaction is equal to, should I do this wrong? No, I'll just do it right. I'm going to do it wrong. So um, sum, see the problem? It's not a delta S. This is not a delta S. This is not a change in entropy. Guys, this is an entropy. So this is the entropy of the products minus the sum of the entropies of the reactants. Guys, it's just final minus initial. So now we need to plug in our actual substances. I better move over here, I'm gonna run out of space. So delta S for the reaction is equal to, we only have one product. So it's two times the entropy of NH3 minus the quantity one times the entropy of N2 plus three times the entropy of H2, and we need each of those in their gaseous forms. Wait, something's wrong. No, that's right, two and three. Are we good? I think I'm okay. I feel good, all right. So guys, now we need numbers. So we need the entropy, so it's going to be two times the entropy of NH3, which is not under ammonia, so I pray it's under nitrogen. So we need NH3 gas, right? Um, it is one positive 192.5. So two times 192.5 joules per mole Kelvin. Minus the entropy of diatomic ni yeah, nitrogen, um, N2, 190, is that this? No, 191.5. So minus 191.5 joules per mole Kelvin plus Now, okay, three times hydrogen diatomic 130.58. And that's joules per mole Kelvin. That's a part of it, yeah. Okay, so guys, let's do the math. One ninety-two point five times two. I get negative. 198.2 joules per mole Kelvin. <clears throat> I 
Did, is that number right? Am I okay? Okay. So guys, well, I'll let you catch up on the math and then we'll talk about what this means and then we're going to wrap this up in just a couple seconds. You guys okay? And did you verify my number? Am I good? Okay. So guys, the important thing to, to realize here is that as we predicted conceptually, that value is negative. We looked at this and said we have four moles of reactant becoming two moles of product. They're all gases, so that doesn't help. So because we have a more simple system, four moles to two moles, entropy is going down. So we predicted that this would be negative, and in fact it is. But guys, do be careful. Remember that these numbers are in joules and not kilojoules per mole um, because that's going to become important on, on Tuesday when we start mixing things together. So guys, any questions on this? Yeah. Oh, you know what, Tracy? It's really interesting you say that because as I was writing down those units for this, they didn't feel right. It's weird. I was writing this down and as I was writing down the units, I was like, this doesn't seem right. And that's exactly why. I knew I was missing something and I couldn't think of it. So I figured I'd just go on. Um, it's actually that, and you're exactly right, that these moles cancel. So this is actually joules per Kelvin. Yeah, for this process. I'm like, it shouldn't be mole specific and I couldn't figure out why. That is joules per Kelvin because the moles cancel. Bless you. That's exactly what it is. Did you catch that? Tracy gets the crown for today. Um, guys, that's exactly what it was, is that those moles cancel and you're left with joules per Kelvin because that number is specific to this reaction. And so, yeah, nice work. That's exactly it. In this, in, yes, when you're coming, yes, yep. No, for whenever you're coming up with those delta S's because the moles, the, the moles drop. Yeah, I'm so glad you caught that. Good, Rachel. Or, yeah. What's that? Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. So you're trying to figure out what does this mean, right? What does that mean, joules per Kelvin? Well, and what it, so... So joules is how we're measuring screwed up. Kelvin is how we're measuring temperature. And so what we could then do with that number is if we could locate the temperature, we could then figure out how many joules of energy is being, in this case, lost in the form of disorder. I'm sorry, ah, gained in the form of, how do I want to say that? So disorders going down, so however you think, whether it's going in or out or whatever, it's the change in energy relative to temperature because what you're gonna find out when we do Gibbs free energy is that this process, the amount of entropy that exchanges is dependent upon temperature. And so temperature is going to become a very important concept when we start thinking about entropy changes because the entropy change for this process is different at different temperatures. Does that make sense? It's a little crazy. Do this. Your, the thing is, your question is great. I think you're going to be a lot more comfortable with it after Tuesday because what we're going to talk about on Tuesday is the role that temperature plays in determining entropy changes. Um, that's what those units are telling you is that the entropy change is temperature dependent. We're going to look at that on Tuesday and I really I'm confident it's going to make sense. Now it's a little weird. Tuesday it's going to be all better. So Matt, were you going to say something? Are you okay? So guys, you good on the math? Okay, so let's do this. Let's now talk about Gibbs free energy. Guys, we're gonna do this relatively quickly. And then we're gonna make this really make sense on Tuesday. So the big idea, 
And you understand these are, these are the bookends, right? We started chapter 19 by saying, what's the most important topic in chapter 19 and therefore the entire unit because five was just a prelude to 19. So what is the most important topic in this unit? Is a reaction spontaneous? Well, guys, now we're ready to talk about this. So let's remind ourselves of the conversations that we've already had. So all, spont all spontaneous reactions, dot, dot, dot. So guys, if I ask you right now, what is it that makes a reaction spontaneous? Relative to enthalpy and relative to entropy, what would you say? So let's do enthalpy first. Relative to enthalpy, what types of reactions are spontaneous? Exothermic, do you remember that? So guys, why do balls roll downhill? Why do nails rust? All of those ideas. Exothermic reactions are the ones that tend to be spontaneous, so we can say that. So these have large negative enthalpy values. That means they're exothermic. Can we specify the status for enthalpy only? Uh, because it is for enthalpy only. I mean, do you, if, if you like the idea, we can do this if this is helpful. Um, so we can just add, oops. Here, if, if this is helpful, we can add the word exothermic. So these have large negative enthalpy values, large delta H's, that means they're exothermic. Now guys, what about in terms of entropy? If a process is spontaneous, does it tend to create an increase or a decrease in disorder? Just think about your bedroom. Guys, does your, spon does your bedroom spontaneously just get trashed or does it spontaneously get organized and picked up? Yeah, guys, spontaneous processes are processes that create increases in disorder. But guys, I suspect that you're probably intuitive enough that you understand that what we just put on the board has the potential to create tension. So let's bring this all together. Are you done writing? You're okay? So guys, think through this with me. If we have a reaction that's really exothermic, and if we've got a reaction that increases entropy, will that reaction be spontaneous? Do you get the idea? Absolutely. If energy is going out and disorder is going up, that process is going to happen. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, guys, what about this? What about if we have a process where it is endothermic? Energy is going in. And in addition to that, it is decreasing entropy. So we have a reaction that's sucking in energy and it's creating order. Is that reaction going to be spontaneous? Never. Guys, that process is not spontaneous. It's not spontaneous because it's requiring an input of energy and it's, create, it's decreasing disorder. That doesn't happen spontaneously. That reaction will never be spontaneous. Do you get it? Okay. But now, guys, you see where this is headed, right? What about the tiebreakers? What if you have a reaction that is exothermic, but it is creating a decrease in disorder. Will that be spontaneous? Sadly, the answer is sometimes. And guys, what about the other? What if we have a reaction that is endothermic, but it does in fact increase the entropy of the universe. Will that be spontaneous? Sometimes. So guys and Rachel, here comes the thing I think you're going to appreciate. What determines the sometimes? Temperature. 
Guys, temperature is the determinant of when these things are actually spontaneous. If we have conflicting realities, and our two realities are enthalpy and entropy. So with that as a little bit of an introduction, guys, if nothing else, and I know that you don't like sometimes, we're gonna talk about sometimes Tuesday. What we're gonna talk about is this. We understand that we have two potentially competing factors that determine if a reaction is spontaneous, enthalpy and entropy. And guys, in order to actually then figure out if a reaction is spontaneous, we've got to take entropy and we've got to take enthalpy and we got to mush them together. And guys, when you take entropy and enthalpy and mush them together, what comes out? Gibbs free energy. Guys, that is what Gibbs free energy does. In order for us to figure out whether or not a reaction is spontaneous, we've got to bring entropy and enthalpy together. We've got to meld them together in such a way that we can talk about the interplay between the two. And guys, that is Gibbs free energy. Now understand recently, um, there's been a movement away from calling it Gibbs free energy. So you'll see in some texts that they just call it free energy. But guys, in either case, uh, Gibbs free energy is defined as a thermodynamic function that brings together enthalpy and entropy. So you ready? Order is about to restore in the universe. Y'all caught up with me? Good heavens. You know what I've discovered over time? These tables are amazingly comfortable. Ugh. It's really, oh, there went my microphone. You have no idea how many times I've napped in this very position. Out there in your desks. Under. It's really true. You guys done? You caught up? Good heavens. <laughs> or I just put it there. It could be one of the two. Yeah, or that. <laughs> All right. So, guys, you ready for this? What is the abbreviation for enthalpy? Enthalpy. H. What is the abbreviation for entropy? S. You ready for this? What is the abbreviation for Gibbs free energy? Praise the Lord. Finally, one that makes sense. We'll make it F. No, we're not going to do that. So, guys, you understand that enthalpy, or I'm sorry, Gibbs free energy is the bringing together of enthalpy and entropy. And this is how that bringing together happens. It is almost beautifully simple. That Gibbs free energy is the difference between the change, well, the enthalpy of a system and the entropy of a system and Rachel, here's our connection, times its temperature. But guys, while this is true, this is really how we think about this. We think about these ideas relative to change because we use enthalpy and entropy in order to study reactions. And reactions, by definition, are changing. And so we are not going to talk about an empirical value for Gibbs free energy. We're going to talk about changes in Gibbs free energy, and those are then the relationship between an enthalpy change and an entropy change times temperature. Is that okay? Okay. So guys, with that said then, this is where we're going to stop today. Guys, the sign of delta G is the bottom line. We're going to flesh this out on Tuesday but this is it.
So guys, let me explain to you why this is such a magic thing, because you guys are always looking for always is and nevers is, right? We hunger for definitives. We hunger for yes, we hunger for no. We hunger for always, we hunger for never. Where was it we had the word tens? And was it Rachel that didn't like it? Was that who? Yeah, we had a tens and we don't like tens, right? But guys, let me give you the always and never. Follow the thought. So here's the idea. If this is exothermic and it increases entropy, will it be spontaneous? Always. If this is endothermic and it decreases, will this be spontaneous? Never. But then we talked about the idea, what if it's exothermic and decreases? Is it spontaneous? Maybe. What if this is endothermic and increases disorder? Is it spontaneous? Maybe. Well, guys, guess what? Gibbs free energy allows us to get rid of the maybes. So here's our always and never. How do you know definitively if a reaction will be spontaneous? And guys, the answer is this. You know definitively if a, and this isn't always never. You know definitively if a reaction is spontaneous based solely upon its delta G value. And it goes like this. If delta G is negative, this process is spontaneous. You'll notice that we had to sort of add the qualifier in the forward direction. So if delta G is negative, then the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction. We'll look more at that on Tuesday. But guys, that's it. You want to know if a reaction is spontaneous? Figure out delta G. If delta G is negative, that is spontaneous. Now guys, what if delta G is zero? It's at equilibrium. And then guys, what if delta G is positive? Is the reaction spontaneous? No. But guess what? The reverse process is. Um, because then you are, um, you're not handling the related signs properly. What is the sign of exothermic? Negative. What is the sign of an increase in entropy? Positive. And those two things would be offsetting, but for the fact that we subtract it. Yeah. That's what we're going to talk about Tuesday. So guys, that's where we are. So we now understand that spontaneity is predicted only by Gibbs free energy. And Gibbs free energy, which is the bringing together of enthalpy and entropy, is the bottom line. If delta G is negative, it's spontaneous. If delta G is zero, it's at equilibrium. If delta G is positive, that process is not spontaneous, but the reverse is. Guys, that's where we're going to stop today. Anything you want to talk about? Or can we spend the next 30 minutes getting this homework done so you don't have homework over the weekend? You guys good? Okay. So guys, here comes your home walk. Goes like this. So guys, again, please remember the way this is going to go down. Tuesday, we will wrap up chapter 19, the unit. It's also short. On um, Thursday, we will start chapter six. Chapter six is cool. You're going to like it. Um, and then, guys, the following Monday with the Subba Bubba, you guys are going to take a test. And then Wednesday, you're going to have the entire day to do at least outlining chapter six. Um, and understand. Oh. 
When I see you Thursday, I'll show you the outline format for chapter six. It's not one we've done before. And, um, and that'll do us. No, no, you can't do all of this. Yeah, no, just, just do the part. Yeah, just do the part of it that you can. So, guys, we have um, 25 minutes. You guys 